I will tell you that leadership is very much about serving people. First of all, if you can't serve people, that tells me that you've got the wrong team. There's one of two things. Either they're going to be part of the solution or they're going to quit. Welcome back to another Hey You Got This Meetup. Um, if you, I feel like everybody here has been here for the most part. Raise your hand if you haven't been to one of our happy hours. Okay, well, welcome. Um, so if you've never been, or hey, you've got this uh, happy hour, the purpose is just to bring good people together. There's no upsell, there's no nothing like that. We just want to genuinely connect people who are all pursuing their passion. And we always try to interview somebody every time. And today's guest is Patrick over here, who you'll hear his story soon. But Patrick is the president of Realty Executive. Realty Executive is a very big uh, company here in Arizona. Raise your hand if you've heard or seen Realty Executive. All right, you're doing a good job with marketing. Yeah, there's, I got there's a lot of it looks like about 25% market share. Awareness. Um, but today we're gonna hear his story on how he became the president. And if you look up on LinkedIn, Realty Executive has thousands of employees. So that's very, um, very, very impressive. So we'll be able to learn a lot, and you guys will be able to ask questions as well. But before we start, something I want to plug is uh, we're doing a big gala event on November 7th in Phoenix. And if you've seen the video, you know, we always try to do good for others. And we do community drives, helping other people like students. In the case of the video, if you raise your hand if you've seen the video, I'm just curious. Okay. So if you haven't seen the video, go through that link, watch it, and you know why like that's our purpose, giving to others. So what we did is, was we gave to a group of fifth graders who never used PowerPoint before and they were from a Title I school and we put together a competition the month of April. So for every week, we had mentors teaching these groups of five to six and their pitch day was the first week of May and they were graduating the following week. And what we did was uh, we had people from the Arizona Cardinals come in as judge, judges that day and each kid got to present and at the end of the event we surprised them with tablets that they all got to take home and that was a big surprise to them because they didn't expect it so that's some of the stuff we do and we're not like a nonprofit; we just do acts of kindness and our goal is just to give so that's my uh, update on hey you got this and uh, I'm excited to well kick off this podcast with Patrick so Patrick why don't you tell people a little bit about your background? Oh my goodness, well first of all, thank you Tom for having me and uh, thank you everybody for showing up since you didn't know who I was and I feel very honored that you guys all decided to spend an afternoon with me. Um, thumbnail on me, uh, I'm originally from the Netherlands, so I immigrated here with my parents, so that's why I have that long last name, Van den Bosch. Uh, went to college in Southern California, uh, went to School of Architecture with the vision of becoming an architect did not become an architect. I started my first business at the age of 26, and really from the age of 26 to something much more than 26, um, I've been running, building businesses, running businesses. I did, uh, I always wanted to be either an artist or something having to do with drawing. What I did was three-dimensional thinking and three-dimensional problem solving. The second part of that is uh, something I didn't understand until I got later on in my career, is um, I'm going to call it conducting or communicating. An architect really operates, takes vision, turns them into reality, but has to navigate a very diverse uh, constituents, ranging anywhere from a client to contractors to subcontractors to jurisdictions, and then to be able to each one of those to conduct, uh, to manage all of those, and to make sure that that no time, no point does that vision in any way get diluted in that. And so as a child. Uh, I knew that I wanted, I was, I thought I was creative, it turns out I'm a left brain, right brain, I'm very creative, but ultimately what I really enjoy is building things. And so uh, I got to live out my life, I got to live out my childhood dream, not knowing that I was going to be doing, doing what I'm doing today. Speaking of building things, how did you get that, you know, courage to start something on your own? Because that's a scary, you know, mindset if you've never done it before. Yeah, so uh, it's a great question. First of all, I want you to know um, courage is you find something you find later on in life when things have worked out. At that moment, uh, I believe life is a series of, I'm going to call it failure, failures. There's a great book by John Maxwell called Failing Forward, 
And it's really about that life is a series of missteps. And what you want to do is make sure those missteps are kind of in the right general direction. <laughs> you don't want them to go backwards. And so, um, so the, the answer to the question is, uh, I was young and dumb, so I didn't know any better. And in many ways, it's not because I felt like I had it all figured out, but I had it figured out for that day. And then the following day, I had it figured out for that day. And then the third day, the following day, I figured it out for that wet day. I've done a lot of triathlons and, and done a lot of, I, I mean, over 120 to give you some idea. And, and people say, how do you do the long races? And I said, one step at a time, right? Some of those races, I ran from here to the mailbox, from the mailbox to the park car. And so that's really how confidence shows up is perseverance and persistence. Confidence is this thing that often is a feeling that, that I go back to that thought, can be dangerous because you can be confident. And the question is, what are you confident in, right? And so, so for me, it's really about persistence. And so in my first business, I was this young, starving junior architect. And um, I ended up getting into manufacturing. And actually, didn't know what I was doing. All I knew was I wanted to start something. And then I just started pursuing it in a thought process. I started pursuing it. And, and Google wasn't, first of all, the word didn't exist, Google. Internet, um, you know, um, uh, it hadn't been invented yet, I'm going to call it. So none of that existed. And so what I did know from college is any time that you had an idea, you did research. And so you did research. And as I did research, I started identifying things that were really kind of interesting. And back in those days, you'd go to a photocopy machine, and you'd make a copy of it, and you put it up on the wall. These will tell you, tell you about what a vision board looks like. You start putting it up on the board. And so when I started putting it together, it wasn't confidence that had me go out blindly, but I started making decisions. And there were a whole bunch of decisions that were, uh, I'm going to call it, weren't, ne weren't necessarily forward uh, creative to the process. But ultimately, the mistakes I made were always in the right direction. If you're going to fall in football, if you fall, if they're going to tackle you, they tell you to fall forward. You always want to fall forward to go pick up that extra yard. I love this football quote because I'm looking at Leo right here. He used to play college football. I just knew so it. Like, I just knew it. I had to pick. I have picked. I have a whole bunch of golf. I have a bunch of football analogies. Yeah, and fun fact about Leo, since we're talking about, he played Division One. So yeah, awesome. Yeah. D1 football player. There you go. Yeah. Now back to our conversation. Um, <laughs> you leave sit up here. Go <laughs> um, I was gonna ask, what were some of the key lessons that you learned during the early days of your career, particularly in your 20s? Get enough sleep. Let me start off with. I, I think um, sleep deprivation is something when you're young. You think it's um, you think you don't need sleep. Everyone needs sleep. Um, I think in the 20s, if I was going to do things all over again, first of all, I would have picked the blonde earlier on. That's one thing I would do. Um, here's what I would say: mistakes I made is I surrounded myself with great friends, and this is going to sound terrible, but it isn't necessarily great friends that are going to be necessarily going to help you achieve the goals that you want to achieve. I'm not suggesting at all to kick your friends to the curb. But you should pick people that are ahead of you. They should be people that are going to be more aligned with where you're going, not kind of where you are or where you've been. Again, not to, I'm not here to say to get rid of your friends. But I say if I had to do it all over again, um, again, I didn't have both Denise and John who are sitting over here. We didn't have the benefit of having a, a collaborative group like this. But I think mentoring, I didn't know. I think I, if I had to do it all over again, Thomas, you're terrific about this. I think mentoring is really good. I also didn't realize when I was in my 20s that when I was, I ended up getting into manufacturing, that it's okay to get your ideas from out of the industry. And so my 20s, being able to listen to people that, even if they have differing opinion, is to just hear them out because sometimes that will prompt an idea. And so if I had to do that all over again, being able to broaden out that circle. And then the last thing I would say is don't lone wolf anything in life because um, your greatest asset is yourself and your worst enemy is yourself. And I think it's, I always tell people, you'll convince yourself about amazing things and you'll convince yourself about things you shouldn't be convincing yourself on, right? And so I think uh, if I do that again, I'd make sure that I had a broader group that was helping me in that. How do you encourage somebody to stay driven, especially in what they do today? In your case, you know, you've done so much in your career 
that if you wanted to, you, you, didn't, you don't have to work if you don't want to. So where do you get the drive to keep being curious to keep going? So there's a, there's a great book, make a lot of plugs in books because we like reading, but there's a great book called Halftime by Bob Buford, which is to move from success to significance. So one of the things that's actually probably part of the answer on things that would do different than 20 year old, 20 years old, you think about things, uh, I want to make a lot of money. I, I want to be very successful. Uh, here's what I would say. I think, it, I think it's super important to transcend beyond that because the money will come and go, to be quite honest. In fact, the saying I say is um, money is the, ex is the byproduct of great execution. It should not come as a surprise that if you do your job well, if you come up with an idea, it should not come as a surprise that people want to buy it, that people want to use your service. It should not come as a surprise. So I always say, why focus on the money? Focus on, so now if you take that away, you should focus on things that transcend time. One of them is, I, I think it's important to understand, um, I'm going to call it a, a lifelong goal of things that are they're going to be with you forever. I think betterment, self-betterment is important. I think, I mentioned time earlier, being mindful about how do you spend your time. Relationships, I think, are super important. I think those are things that often we'll sacrifice early on, and then we wonder later on, well, we have fractured lives because we, we don't have a support system. So for me, um, when I was young, I had a lot of energy, I had a lot of drive, but I would say it was not lifelong, um, it, was not, it was not lifelong sustainable because I tell people, it's like, you can go, I went to School of Architecture, I was, I became a master at slight sleep deprivation because we didn't have CAD systems and computers to do that. I was all hand-drawn. And so, but the thing is, <clears throat> you, you want to think in terms of things that are sustainable for the long term. And so, um, so I think to be driven, you, when you start putting out a goal out there about, hey, look, you know, I love what you said, Thomas, about earlier about giving back, right? But, but I'll take it to a different level is, hey, look, one of the things I want to achieve in life is I want to do well. I want to be, I want to excel at my craft to make this, a be, you know, to make my, not to make my mark, but to be able to impact on my community. Those are goals that transcend, because I do think if you make it more outward facing, you'll do a great, you'll do yourself a great favor internally. If you focus on internal goals, then you'll be self-driven, and the only one that you end up satisfying is yourself, which is kind of a lonely, uh, lonely life. Since this is called the Hey, You Got This podcast, yeah. I want you to think of a moment where you were knocked down. Walk us through how somebody helped you get up in that moment. Well, I've been, I've been knocked down a lot, let me start off with. So I've been, I've probably spent, um, the, the thing is not, you know, it's a, I think it's a quote, right? It's not about getting knocked down, it's getting up. That's the, kind of the key. Um, here's what I would say, and Denise has been a big part of this. Like, um, Denise has been through um, both my highs and lows, and I think it's super important that you have people around you that really genuinely love you, genuinely care about you, regardless of the successes. I think that's super important because um, you'll find very quickly when, when you're very successful, friends are easy to get. That's not a problem whatsoever. As soon as you have that challenge where perhaps you're having to deal with, I've been there, right? I've dealt with on the verge of bankruptcy, on the verge of whatever that is, to deal with that, you find very quickly on how quiet the room is and how very few people are in the room. Uh, there's an exercise um, that I encourage all of you to do, which is if you were to think about kind of your last day or your dying bed, who would be around your bed at that moment, okay? If this was your last day and you're about to pass on and you're laying in bed, who would be people around your bed? And then remove all your family members from the people around your bed. Who is remaining? And that will tell you volumes of where you stand and how you're committed, how you're connected in your, uh, in your sphere. Wow, that's, that's a deep, deep thought, but it's very, it's very true. I mean, what you say is surround yourself with people that motivate you and are there for you in your worst moments. Now, in terms of like your team, you have so many people that look up to you. What, what do you do to keep people like motivated and they're okay, especially in their dark times, right? 
Because today, you know, with mental health and everything, sometimes it's not just work. What do you do to ensure that you're there for your team, especially when you have so many people looking up to you? Yeah, so um, I got this right early on in my career, which is the inverted pyramid. So as a CEO of the company, I'm at the bottom, right? Because truth of the matter is the people that touch my customers are at the top of the, uh, top of the pyramid. They're the ones that really represent the brand. They're the ones that are gonna have the biggest impact on someone returning for service, our services or deciding to use our services. And so I think that's super important. I'm big on flat org charts. I don't believe at all in uh, traditional organizational, um, uh, f uh, I call it hierarchies. I find them, first of all, they, they I think they, they, I'm gonna call it, they kind of hamstring people in making their decisions, going big on self-empowerment. Here's the thing I will tell you, and, and then everyone on my team, if they sat here, will tell you. I have a saying, we cry together, we laugh together. And, and, and when you're genuinely authentic about it, when they see, like in my role as, as the CEO of the company, so as, as a leader in the company, when they see how you behave in the trenches during the bad time, and again, not to hide from it, that, that when they see when I make a mistake and I talk about that mistake and talk about it in an authentic way, people pay notice to that. And that's, those are things that are really impactful. So for my team, they're super empowered. I talk to them as business owners. We have our big annual conference coming up in November and my corporate VP, Alicia, is the business owner of that conference. That means I work for her in that conference. I work for her as a resource and I am, I am disciplined about that, not just words, because it's so important. Remember I said earlier, words become actions. Well, your actions need to match up with your words. And my team will tell you without a doubt. And by the way, they are very comfortable talking about anything with me, which is an indication that, because uh, communication is one of the things that is so key in leadership and, and making people feel like they're belonging to something because again, you spend more time at your job, so to speak, at your vocation, than you do with your family members. Besides communication, what advice do you have on being a great leader? Is there anything else that like, someone like myself should know when growing a company? You know, um, so f f for Denise and I, so we're big on servant leadership. So I believe very firm, firmly that for so many decades, leadership was this thing. So there's a saying, right? Managers suppress, leaders lift people up. And so uh, I will tell you that leadership is very much about serving people, serving customers. I have a responsibility of serving my team. If I don't think in those terms that I'm missing my mark as a leader, I find that uh, my advice in leadership is um, people use the word humbleness. I say it's about making sure that you, first of all, if you can't serve people, that tells me that you've got the wrong team. If you've got to tell people what to do and direct them and tell them exactly and, and, and create levels of accountability to make sure they get their job done, I would question if you have the right team. And so for me, leadership is this thing where you're serving them. If, you, if you've got the right people, empower them let them run, but also make them understand, where, be clear about your goals and objectives, and be clear about the boundaries. Here are the things, there are the, I call it the, these are the, these are the, these are the game, these are the game stoppers, right? The, we're not going to, our profit margin is never gonna be lower than this. These are the revenues that we, as soon as this happens, these are the changes we're gonna make. You're gonna, when you're clear about that, then beyond that, don't micromanage them, let them go. Earlier you were saying, you know, during good times, everybody smiles. Yeah. Everyone's happy. They're giving high fives. But what if, you know, you're in the red one month for the next month, it's red again. How do you navigate those challenges when it doesn't look so great? Boy, that's where you really get to find out what it's like to be a leader. So first of all, and, and look, I, I mean, I didn't notice in my 20s, let me start off with, but people... People don't like bad news, but they really don't like not knowing what's going on. So I always tell people that when they don't have the information, the movie they play in their head is the worst version of what it can be. And so, so if you're in the red, remember I said earlier, don't lone wolf anything, right? You'll be amazed. If you get everyone to be included in it, first of all, if they're with the company, they're going to live through it, and it's not fair for them to be along on a ride 
and I call it, if they're in the car and you don't even tell them, you blindfold them and you're gonna tell them, you're gonna go off the cliff, it's not fair for them. Mm -hmm. So it is important to say, look, we don't have brakes, we're going around this curve, anybody have any ideas, right? And, and really, because they're vested already. And so to me, it is super important that you, and I call it age appropriate, like you might have people, like I've got folks in my concierge, I'm, in, I'm not necessarily gonna go through all the details of financials, but I think it's also important that they know that, hey, yuck, we have some challenges. We need to really tighten our belt. We need to figure out how to save X dollars because we gotta convince the bank to give us a line of credit. People can rally around. There's one of two things. Either they're gonna be part of the solution or they're gonna quit. And you'd rather that they quit than rather be part of the process and get in the way of the process. Speaking of dark days, what do you do when a team member on your staff or on your team isn't doing so great? Like they've hit their wall a bunch of times. How do you get that team member up? So I go back to communication. So it should not be, I always tell people when, when you have to sit down with somebody and tell them they've done, they're not doing well and, and they're shocked by it, then you need to take responsibility for it. That means that they were not aware what the goals and objectives are. So I'll give the example of your sale of Denise's, Denise's in sales and her goal is to do a million dollars and I pull her into my office because she's at 500,000 and I'm telling her, my goodness, you're not pulling your weight, you're only at 500,000 and she's shocked, that's my fault. Mm -hmm. That means I've not communicated to her what the expectation is. And so, so the answer to your question is, so if that happens, if the conversation we're back up here, so one, it should not be surprised. The second is back to your question about how do you lift them up. They should be coming to you for help. If you've set this up right, but they know what the goals are, and they know that the process is, hey, look, I'm here to help you, they should be engaged. If you have provided the right environment of communication, the right environment of support, the right leadership, they'll come to you. They'll come to you and say, look, I'm really struggling on this. I need some help on it. Because you think about it, it's like, if you have a child or you have a friend, they'll come to you if they know that they can depend on you. If they wait till that doomsday, I'm gonna call it that judgment day, then I would say there's a problem in the, in the, um, in the communication process, in the hierarchy of a communication flow. What advice do you have for someone today who wants to start something of their own or just do something that's considered scary and they don't know what the unknown looks like. Okay, so uh, Denise is actually with me and someone came to me and they heard me speak and they actually remembered, which is always a great, it's always a great compliment to me when they repeat back that they actually, something I actually said. So this is what he said, I'll never forget, he goes, I wish I had heard you speak before I started my business. It takes twice as much money it takes twice as long. Let me start off, and that's the first thing I tell people. So no matter what you think, whatever you, whatever you want to pursue, start with those two facts right off the bat. It'll set the expectation. And I think beyond that, um, just understand what the set, there's a sacrifice. In starting anything, there's, there's a cycle. There's, I call it, there's, there's actually three cycles to it. One is the sacrifice cycle. <laughs> that if you get through the sacrifice cycle, you'll have some rewards, and then there's the backside of this where all of a sudden I call this almost like founder's disease where it runs out of steam, where perhaps the idea either, it could be a business that all of a sudden has found its own level, or maybe it's a business that's no longer a service that nobody, somebody doesn't want, but it has three cycles to it. I guarantee, it used to be a seven year cycle. Today, those cycles could be as short as a year to be quite honest, because just because of the, 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 the digital platform, the technology platform that's out there. but. But I would say be mindful, it takes twice as long, twice as much money, and then, you know what, just be thoughtful in that approach. And then and the last thing I'll say is be agile and pivot. I, I say it's like, I'll take football, right? Football, you, draw, you do the X's and O's, and, and if everyone follows the X's and O's, it should be a really nice, clean block and a, and a nice hole for you to run through. But truth of the matter is there's human beings involved, and human beings are messy. Let me start off with, we are, we are the, I, in, my, in my balance sheet on the financials, they are the inconsistency. Because, you know, today Denise is a model employee, she goes home, 
she has a fight with her husband who is not paying attention to her, which is me. And so she comes tomorrow with an attitude, and all of a sudden that's changed. And so people are messy. And so I, I think, you know, just be mindful of that. I like it. Um, what are common advice that you give to people that you advise? Because I know that you advise a lot of people, in, including right here in the front row. So, so uh, I'll pick on John because I sit on his board. He's got a great company called The Perfect Companion. that's has grown leaps and bounds because he's done some great things. Uh, but his advice he'll tell you is, um, first of all, um, focus on the core things. I remove all the, I tell them, do not, entrepreneurs, when you start a business, you'll have like a million ideas. And, and by the way, you have a million today and then you have another million tomorrow. And then you create all these lists that are to-do lists and all these idea lists. And then the truth of the matter is you're now in the business of making lists. You're not in the, you're not in the business of executing. So John will tell you, as I, I used to say, I, I still tell him, Take the ideas, I don't say throw them out, park them over here. Focus on the business, focus on the fundamentals. Again, I'm gonna just pick on Leo here. In football, they always say focus on the fundamentals, right? Don't get too cute, focus on the fundamentals, right? If, it doesn't matter, if you start getting really cute, you could do a lot of juking and jiving and, and you could never move from the same spot. <laughs> like never, you could spend a lot of energy and never move from the same spot. So I would say um, the, the number one advice I give is don't be distracted, be focused. But I would say be loosely focused. Some people get too intensely focused and so narrow focused they don't give their, their they don't give themselves a chance, a margin, to make the necessary pivot or the necessary change in that. And so they get so fixated on it that they become so stubborn and headstrong in that idea that they are marching forward and they could be just one degree off from a great idea and a great execution. What are good habits to practice? Well, I go back to sleep. That's a good one. Because <laughs> you've got to remember, I said earlier, thoughts become words. And guess where the thoughts come from your brain? And if your brain isn't uh, healthy or, or well rested, um, you'll get the lesser version of yourself every single day, by the way. It's, 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 um, it's uh, data has shown that. Um, so I would say that um, I, I think. Uh, energy is important. I think for me, uh, some of those habits, uh, Denise and I, we read a lot. I think uh, I love reading. Most of my stuff I read nonfiction. I'm reading, um, I say reading, I listen to Audible on George Washington. And I find that thought process, but I read, um, the other book I'm reading is, um, is, um, is called The Gap in the Gain, which is a book written by, um, by um, and I'm drawing a blank on his name, but anyway, uh, great book. Um, to me, reading is super important. Um, I think it, I love, like an event like this, I like listening to people, I like hearing ideas. And, and by the way, they don't have to, I'm not looking for, I like hearing different, uh, I, I call it different life experiences, I think they're super helpful. Um, I think the other thing is, I think there's a habit, I, I'm, I think it is important, because um, I think if you under, start understanding how to be efficient in your day, I think we tend, especially at a younger age, we go, we run so hard and we think we have all the energy, we're indestructible and we can go just forever and we start from seven o'clock in the morning and we'll run till seven o'clock at night. Truth of the matter is there's only a certain amount of time that you're really productive and efficient. And I think prioritizing your day that way I think is super, super important. And that's a good habit. That's a good habit to develop earlier. Denise will tell you, right, wrong, or different, I'm super disciplined in what I do and 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 understanding um, how to prioritize on that every single day have been formed from my young age, my 20s, not because I got it all right, but I did understand how to prioritize my day every single day. Since you talked a lot about Denise, I have a question about your relationship with her. What is it like to work with your significant other? Well, it, I don't know any different, let me start off with, but what I'll tell you is, um, like Denise, her desk is amazingly clean and mine isn't because I, I, tend to, I tend to run hard pretty hard. So early on in our relationship, she learned a hard way never to clean my desk, right? Like she, <laughs> she'll tell you that story. Uh, here's what I would say. Um, like I feel very blessed that um, I believe in integrated life. I think one of the things we're not wired for and we're not created for is it used to be that people say, well, leave work at home, leave work at the doorstep. But I say, well, wait a minute, but you're the same person. Now, how do you take things out of your head 
that you just live through. And so I think integrated life is super important, which really speaks to then that whatever you pick as a vocation, it should be something that you're not, that if you gotta leave it at the door and you're not willing to share with those that you live with or that you spend time with, good or bad, I would question why you're in that vocation. Don't get me wrong, life is a series of stepping stones. Don't get me wrong, I've done, I've done, I was worked at the car washes. I can tell you about some of the crappy jobs. And by the way, the crappiest job I had was starting up a business and then I had to go make payroll and I had to learn how to clean toilets and do all those things. I can tell you stories about all that because I couldn't afford anything. And so, but I think for Denise and I, um, we get, for us, we get to talk, we've been in the same industry. I mean, real estate now, but even in my younger days when I started in the business, we were in the same industry. Uh, I was in manufacturing and, and I was making, uh, I was in the, I became the, the, the largest manufacturer of modular buildings and Denise was one of my clients. I married my client, so. Um, one of my clients, I married. Not, it was not like the norm, I married every client. There uh, <laughs> was not a benefit that I provided as a manufacturer. Uh, but Denise will tell you that uh, for us, it's always been our pillow talk, right? It's nice to be able to talk about it and not have to explain the mechanics of an industry because she understands the industry. So that makes it, that, that's the good part. The bad part is she knows this industry. And so sometimes it, it's, it, she she's she's a different part of the business, and it might not be something that I'm ready to talk about. And that gets in a whole nother world. That gets into a whole nother conversation about men and women, and love languages, and all those other things. And I'm not here to give marital advice. So, something I think that would be awesome to highlight is just you remember how we were eating lunch and you were telling me about your daughter and how yeah. she just started a career on TikTok. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's pretty relevant. Why don't you share that story? So our daughter, who uh, her name is Bella, I'm the only one that calls her Isabella. Um, I'll start off with the with the end of the story because it's a lot more interesting. I'll build up to it. Today she's about uh, 120,000 followers is what she has, and she's very entrepreneurial because she grew up around Denise and I are very entrepreneurial. She she started a business at the age of 16 where she decided she was going to do streetwear, and uh, she developed a streetwear called Rookie's Movement, and uh, on her own. She was really, she, she used my Rolodex. She would call people in my Rolodex to get the right people, but she ended up uh, getting Snoop Dogg's backup dancers to wear her outfit because she was, remember I said earlier about perseverance and persistence? She had perseverance and persistence. She got them to wear it. As a, the, the business was a complete failure because she made no money. She was literally having to underwrite everything, but she learned how to, how to break through those doors. By the way, it's often not breaking down the doors, it's literally going through the window, to be quite honest, is how you get there. Um, but she decided, she was working for a company, and she decided that she felt that there was a real need out there on interior design, and she wanted to communicate it. She's got a small condominium in Marina del Rey, and she's like, she went to go get uh, look at furniture, and she's like, this is outrageous how much this furniture is. And because she, her earlier foray got her exposed to the overseas market in some of the things that she developed in the streetwear, she used those same, same context to find out that you can get this stuff for cheaper, and she decided to, she, so she, she's proud to say, no, she's 25, so she's one of the few people that got a cease and desist from Restoration Hardware because she formed a full website on rest, a playoff of Restoration Hardware. In my, in my work, in, when I started my first company, I named it Standard Pacific Industries, not knowing that there was a big home builder named Standard Pacific. I had that, I was running, I, was, I built the company for about three years and then I got a lovely cease and desist that said stop using our name uh -huh. and uh, then I knew I arrived because they were paying attention to me. So I say that because Isabella developed this and uh, she decided to use TikTok as a way of saying, well look, I'm going to show them how to decorate and people started following her and she went from literally the beginning of this year to really no followers to about 120,000 followers today. I, I think the other part to mention is that she started doing affiliate marketing, right? Yeah. So what she did is she signed up for all these accounts and she makes videos, but then she hyperlinks her bio to you know, these items that she makes videos for. And she does pretty good for just posting videos at home. And, and this is just something that everybody can do if that's what they're into. So I think that's like a cool story to mention. And now back to your story, I think something that I would like to hear is if you can share, you know, those dark days, a particular moment, you know, how 
Did it just look really cloudy? I, I want to hear, what did you do to get out of the clouds? One so, moment that you can think of. So the one story that I'll tell, there's lots of stories, but the one I think, so um, I brought Barry Jackson to Las Vegas. And literally when I brought him to Vegas was during, and Denise was there, during a time when the markets was in a complete free fall in 2007. So we were there opening up with a multi-million dollar event, selling multi-million dollar cars, and the stock market was literally in a free fall. And so we were committed. It was, the, the this is right, the day that it happened. And so, uh, and everyone looked at me and said, what are we gonna do? And I thought about it and I said, you know what? We're going to go out to the community because I think the community, they're going to be so scared that they'll want to be part of something that makes that allows them to escape from it. So we, I hired people to go into the communities with billboards, traveling billboards on cars to come out to the event. And we started just pushing in, uh, marketing just in the town of Vegas, the surrounding area. And I said, let's just fill out this arena because if we can fill out the arena, whatever buyers are here, they'll be excited about having so many people in the audience that I think they'll engage. Uh, we opened up the next day and we had so many people lined up, they used to tell you, that I was literally, they, the ticket takers couldn't sell tickets fast enough. I would take wads of tickets and walk all the way to the end of the line and just literally, my system was with me, I would hand out tickets and take cash to get them into the event. We ended up in that event, we ended up doing an inaugural event from scratch during the free fall. We ended up in a two-day event doing $23 million. Whoa. That's, that's a lot. I was looking at Denise, and I feel that you remember that day very well, right? Is there anything else, Scrappy, that you've done that you think other people can do as well? Like, well, I think there's, you know, here's what I would say. Um, you know, the SEALs have a saying, it's called the 40% rule, which is whenever, in, as a SEAL, I'm not a SEAL, never have been a SEAL, and my goodness, the world's really gone bad if I'm a SEAL. But, it, but, but if you, the SEALs have a saying that whatever threshold of pain you hit, like the worst pain, doesn't matter if you're holding your breath or you're just under, under pain, whatever the pain is, they have a saying that it says it's only 40% it's only of what you're capable of. So I actually believe the saying is that no matter what we have as a limitation, what's the answer? It's only 40% of what we're capable of. Uh, there's, a, there's a study that was done, I think it was Stanford, right? So, so people do this. If you were to tell, I say to Laura, go run 100 miles. If I told her, just keep running, just run, and I'll tell you when to stop. She will run slow, and she'll run going, well, when do I stop? If I told her, go run 100 miles, she knows what her goal is. She'll be prepared for it. So I think what's so important is that we end up undercutting our own success, limiting our own success, that part of it is came, coming up with waypoints saying, hey, look, here's what I need to achieve. Because there's a saying, right? How do you eat an elephant? And the answer is you eat it one bite at a time, right? So we tend to stare at the elephant. And this is the other thing we do. Then we get up really close to the elephant like this, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And we end up kind of sabotaging our own success. So one, I would say, is realize no matter what the limitation is, it's only 40% of what you're capable of. By the way, the one thing that often, unless we've not got enough sleep or we haven't taken care of our health, we always have our health. Like the one thing that they can't take away from, no matter what, they can't take away you, right? Like you start off going, look what? Worse, I still have me, right? Like I still have good work in arms, legs, whatever, I got a brain. I got things that I can work from. And so I call the 40% rule. The other thing is, let's figure out, figure out what those waypoints are. Let's get those, look, if you're out in the middle of the ocean and you don't know where land is, pick a point. Hey, look, I'm gonna go swim for 15 minutes, take a rest. Pick some point. I remember I said earlier, how do you run a marathon or an Ironman? Pick these points so that you don't mentally start shutting down because an answer will come to you. And maybe it's not the perfect answer, but we are driven by hope. And if we don't have some sense of hope, a glimmer of hope, back to mental health, we end up self-sabotaging ourselves. I have two more questions for Patrick, and then I'm going to open up for the audience. So this is a good time to think of questions you would like to ask Patrick. Now, Patrick, my second to last question to you is, what is your advice for finding joy in what you do? 
That's a great question. Actually, Denise's um, favorite uh, quote is always be joyful. So, um, so there, people think of happiness and joy being the same thing. They're not, by the way. There's a happy, uh, happiness comes from a Greek word which actually means happenstance. So happiness is very episodic. And it's almost, almost accidental. Joyful is a choice. So I love this question because it's a choice. I always tell, Denise has heard me say this for over 25 years. Um, patience. She says, I'm not patient. And patience is a choice. Joy is a choice. So for me, I make a choice every day to be joyful. And that doesn't mean that every day is easy, doesn't mean every day is good, but you get to choose and you choose joy, which is different than happiness. And so I'm very purposeful about it. Denise will tell you, um, you know, there's not, um, it's my strength, I want to say, not because. Um, it, it's my strength only because uh, my strength is I'm pretty unflappable. Doesn't matter if things are even that day. Denise will tell you uh, I did not freak out because I learned a long time ago when I was in my 20s. Um, freaking out does not solve anything. In fact, it makes matters worse. By the way, suppressing doesn't help anything either. I think it's good to be uh, it's good to be uh, honest about your feelings. But joy for me is something that is a choice, and I choose that, and so does Denise. And so um, I wake up in the morning, and I, we've got a, a vision board, and it's written right out of the things that are important to us, and joy is one of those things that we choose. Serving and joy are the two things that we look at every day we get dressed. I like that a lot. I want to hear you know when somebody does not feel joyful about what they're doing, at what point do you advise for somebody to consider a, you know, a left turn? Well, it, it depends. So, um, so this happens to all of us where we go, oh, my goodness, this job is a drag. And I always say, it might not be the job, it might be what you're dealing with, right? Sometimes, right, we all have that wonderful, we all have that wonderful career until that crappy person walks in and ruins our day. And then what we'll say is, man, if we love our job or we love what we do, we might just say it's a bad, just a bad moment. But so many of us mischaracterize that experience as I'm just unhappy or I'm back up here. I've lost my joy, right? They think of it as that the problem is the career or the problem is the company. And often it is the person you're dealing with. And so I think it's really important to understand your circumstances in that because um, it, it, we just we mischaracterize that. And so. Um, so having said that, I think I go back to, if you understand your, so uh, for my team, and this back to your earlier question, we talk in terms of, I don't do, I don't do, uh, what, uh, what do you call it, uh, I don't do uh, interviews or what do you call it, uh, for, for raises, right? So I don't do reviews. I do career development. And, and the one thing I talk about in career development, I tell this on every one of my team. And Denise has known this. By the way, people tell, Denise will tell you there are people that have worked for me for decades ago. And my saying to them is, let's figure out your career path. And by the way, do not let that career path be limited to who you work for or where you work. It is so important because I have found some of the greatest people that have worked for me, their career path was outside the company. And they never left the company because I allowed them to build their career path. And they found they were so fulfilled within the confines of the company that I, they were with that they achieved all their goals. But I was willing to say, look, the path is, man, you're qualified to become a CEO for a, a, a you, you're qualified to become a CEO, your goal, the career development is a COO for a 15, $20 million business, let's put you on that path. And by the way, I wanna be there for your graduation when you leave the company. And in many cases, they never leave the company because the company grew, we grew, because guess what, they grew. They grew, our company grew, and it gave them the be they gave them the opportunity. Wow, I just love that, what you just said about being a career development like team member mm. for your team, especially as it grows. The the final question I have is, what advice would you give to your younger self based on all the knowledge that you've acquired and what you've done? Pretend that you know you went back in time and you can talk to your younger self, say. 30-year-old Patrick, what would you tell 30-year-old Patrick? Uh, I'm going to say my 26-year-old self because okay. that's when I started my first company. Um, don't be stubborn. That's the first thing I'd say. I said this earlier. Um, you know, 
When I went to school, uh, although I learned earlier how to be collaborative, uh, I grew at a time where you just, when you decided to become successful, you did it on your own, you kind of focused on your own. I would tell my younger self, do not do this alone. Do not do this alone. Do not be stubborn. Um, open up your, and then, by the way, I've always been accepting to other people, but pretty set in my ways. To these, um, when I first came to the States, again, I'm from the Netherlands, she met my first, um, one of my first friends in the States, his name is Joel Dingman, and Denise, we had a home in California, and Denise says, what was Patrick like? And he said he was always marching to his own drum. And, and I, I always thought that was a benefit, I always thought that was a positive, but it really isn't, because it could be a lonely parade if you, just, if you just fall in the beat of your own drum. So I think stubbornness, I would tell my self, younger self, don't be stubborn. I think it's okay to be persistent, I think it's okay to be focused, but don't be stubborn. Awesome. Um, if you got a question, raise your hand, and then I will have to uh, share your question to the microphone. So it's on our podcast. Well, if I can hear you, I'll just say yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, you can just say in the microphone. Yeah. So raise your hand. Um, Tristan, what is your question? Hey, man, thanks again for coming. Yeah, um, I just had a question really around your mentorship, kind of how you either sought out or you know, how you kind of gained mentorship and kind of advice on you know, how that happened. So... so um, Great question, by the way. So, the people that oh, I what mentor. What was the question? So, so, I'm sorry. Could you hear? Can you all hear the question? Is I think the I'm going to paraphrase that. Yeah. So the question is, the question really is about um, I'm going to call it the input advice about how to set up a mentorship arrangement or, or a relationship. I think is the, the gist of it. Is that I got it right? right yeah. So um, first of all, I've been a mentor for a long time. Um, the one thing I find is to be quality. Uh, you can't mentor everybody, let me start off with. Often my mentees, um, I've got a mentee right now that's going on to the second year, but he is uh, about a, I'd say about, this would be his last year with me because I need to kind of push him out the nest. Uh, the other thing is I make the mentee, uh, the mentee has to be structured, he has to show up with an agenda, they actually send it to me um, uh, no, no later than the day before so I can look at it. And then it says, uh, by the way, it's only three things. What are the three meaningful things that have happened since the last time we met? What are the three things that are your, what are your right, like what's in front of you that are, you believe are your biggest, uh, what are your biggest challenges? And then the last questions are, tell me about the three things that you're doing for yourself that you're pouring into yourself. They always send me financials because I want to know, I, um, I want to know, because first of all, financials is a good snapshot of where the business is at. They always send it to me, it gets sent to me, I read it so when we sit down together, we're in a structured environment. Otherwise, you could sit there for an hour, two hours, and you might be lucky if you, have, if you cover one thing. And so I always tell, the, the deal I have with my mentees is, I'm gonna give you an hour, that's, by the way, I'm very specific, it's an hour. You need to be organized about that hour and get the best value of the hour, and you need to, be on, you need to honor my time. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, so how, is your company evolving with Gen Z coming to the workforce? So that's yeah. one of the questions I want to know, especially with technology. So the question is, how is my company preparing itself on how to respond to the Gen Z, I'm going to say demands, because it's really demands, right? So you guys have demands. I assume you're Gen Z, so. Uh, here's what I would say. First of all, um, technology is, uh, so we, we've got a pretty good technology platform. Here's my firm belief. Um, and it's something that I really push as a culture in my company. The one thing is, I don't care what age group it is, um, first of all, we're in the people business and we're in the people serving people business. To me, technology is very much, I have very integrated. I, I'm a technology, Denise will tell you, I'm a, I've always been a technology guy. I was one of the first guys I could tell, I was, I was, I, I was teaching myself basic and Fortran and Cobalt. At a, at a time where you plugged in your, 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 hand, your, your Tandy into a TV set, and that's how you program. So, um, so technology, to me, my personal opinion is, uh, I think the world uh, uses it as a crutch to say that's all the millennials want. This is what they want. They just, I think a Gen Z engage in a different way. And truth of the matter is, if you, one, authenticity is super important in it, and I'm focused on that. Remember, as I said earlier, I've got a whole, my entire company is based around that because I firmly believe 
that um, if you got to, um, although we have our core values, but those are not things that are meant to live on the wall, they're meant to live in your heart. And so I think for, so that's number one. Number two, collaboration and collaborativeness. I think that's important. I think technology uh, is all interwoven into that. So I'll give you an example. For me and the company, I do both virtual meetings, uh, I'm sorry, virtual gatherings and in-person gatherings. And we have gatherings that are both, that both have virtual elements to it and in-person elements to it. I'm very mindful on time, for example. A lot of the stuff we do, again, are 20 minute segments, vignettes. So we have a pace that's, I call it the TikTok speed, right? We are very focused on that. So we communicate um, in a very specific way. Uh, I'm very mindful about short attention spans, so we never go through long agendas and long diatribes. We're very focused on that. So I will tell you, uh, a, number, a number of the Gen Zs have actually joined our company because they find that even though there are a lot of companies out there that on the surface look really um, hip, and they are because they've done a great job in marketing, often what they find is, number one, and by the way, Gen Z statistics show, data shows this, they give you a chance, but as soon as you're not authentic, they cut you off at the knees. And so I'm very focused on being authentic. So when they join us, we're super authentic about that, and it's really resonating. So that's how we how we prepare ourselves. Great question, by the way. Thank you. I just had a question that popped up that I think everybody would like to hear. Um, I guess, you know, I, I would like to share how we met. Yeah. Because a lot of people like to wonder. So how we met was I sent you a cold email, right? And this is something a lot of people probably wonder, like, how do you get a hold of people? From your perspective, what made you want to meet with me, somebody you had no, you didn't know who I was, and now, you know, you're here today, and are you going to meet my family on Thursday? Yeah. So. We're having great, authentic Vietnamese food on yeah. Thursday, so, um, so, and by this is proof of, um, that's just a byproduct of, of, of a great relationship, right? So it should not come as a surprise that Thomas has invited us over for dinner with his family. Uh, answer to the question is, uh, I, got a, I got an email from Thomas, but first thing I saw was that he was a YPO, or so I belonged to, both he and I belonged to an organization called YPO. So right off the bat, I knew what the core values of YPO was. So, so YPO has a, a commitment in it that says if a YPO will reach out, you have 48 hours to respond to it. So I did. I didn't know Thomas from Adam, and I reached out to him, and I had, uh, I had lunch with him and got to know him. And so for me, it's no different, by the way. If you're around great people, if, if John said to me, hey, I, I want you to meet somebody, my first, if, if he knows me, he'll know that he will be, he'll honor my time, he won't waste my time, and so the answer will always be yes. Well, I'm glad that you responded and we're here today. Um, in the back. Do you do your own hiring? And if, if so, what are you looking for in candidates? Uh, the question is, do I do my own hiring? So um, I'm going to say yes, but I'm going to put a caveat on it. I've got a great, we've got a great um, recruiting uh, talent core, I'm sorry, ta talent, uh, our human, I'm sorry, our people, a people's person is awesome, and like for example, we're hiring developers right now. Uh, we put our we put our quality uh, our qualified people up front as part of making sure that someone is qualified. We have an entire process for it, but here's what I would say: once we have a candidate that we believe is a good fit, there are two major things that happen. And again, if it's a key position, they uh, get interviewed by everyone on the team. Okay, that goes from concierge to C-level suite, they, everybody gets stuck. Because my belief is, if you're gonna work with somebody, it's no different than uh, if I was gonna meet, I'm gonna meet Thomas' family, right? I've met Thomas, but I'm gonna meet the rest of his family because here we're having this relationship and so it's important that he gets he to meet his parents, blah, blah, blah. So that's super important. The second thing is, we put all key positions through case studies. And so, and by the way, the case studies is not about right or wrong. Um, so what we look for is, uh, we put them in a, there's two, three things that we do. We give them a case study, depending on what the position is, and we put them in a room with a computer, and, and that computer, they can search anything, but we find out, first of all, we put them in an environment that feels stressful, because if you get put in a room on an interview, it feels a little bit like, you know, is there cameras in here, so that, that's meant to create a bit of a pressure. Secondly, we're very interested in where you search. We're very interested to see where you look for information. Thirdly, we're looking for 
how you communicate those solutions. It isn't necessarily about what the right answer is, but how do you communicate that? Because a lot of the, our case studies are, you know, how would you solve this problem? And, and we're not looking for, oh, we just, you know, it could be supply chain. Hey, well, all we're going to do is going to go source it in China. We are interested in hearing the journey. We give them enough guidance to do it, but we leave lots of holes in it to find out what their critical thinking process is. The number one thing in the business that's going to be agile is having good critical thinkers. And don't confuse that for someone, for thinking that's critical about somebody, it's being able to think through that as you face challenges is what will trigger in your mind to start thinking about solutions and participating in those solutions. That's critical thinking. We have room for two more questions before we wrap this up. Uh, Nick, what's your question? I appreciate um, everything you stuff. You spoke a lot and you said you spoke before a little bit on making decisions in the moment when you're uncomfortable. Is there any exercise or any maybe um, flash that you may do in the moment that you might not even know that you think about when those do come? So you're in Vegas, things happen, well, what are we going to do? Is there anything you can develop that you can step out and you go, I'm going to run through these couple of things, or is there anything that you can feel like you can actually give advice or guide you to yeah, so I'm going to try to distill that. And I think what is the question is, is there some exercise or some habits that I've developed that allow me in the moment to really respond to a critical decision process that's got tremendous science, uh, time sensitivity to it? Did I got that right? So there's a, I'm sure a number of you read it, uh, but there's a book called uh, Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. So pick any habit. The reason why you're really good at it is because you spend more than 10,000 hours on it. So the answer to your question is, if you focus 10,000 hours on those right things in life, when those things happen, they'll come right, they'll be like automatic. You, uh, how you position yourself from an attitude standpoint, the calmness that you will have, how you organize your thought process, how to quickly assess the situation and put aside the distraction. The, the last thing I would say is, Try to get in front of you the evidence that's most important in determining how to respond, how to respond with a decision. And that only happens with 10,000 hours. Again, I'm gonna pick on Leo, right? So the reason why he made Division One, and a whole lot of people don't make Division One, because he developed skill sets he didn't have to worry about. He had spent so many hours that he doesn't have to remember, oh, when this guy comes, I'm gonna go left. That happens automatically. If he's gotta think about it, he's done, okay? So, so you got to, I remember I said earlier, make sure you spend time on those things, develop that skill set, because there'll be a time, in my case it was in Vegas, there'll be a time where there'll be crunch time and those things will rush forward. Again, remember I said earlier, freaking out doesn't solve anything. So many people have spent 10,000 hours getting really good at freaking out. So guess what happens? The first time that there's some kind of calamity, their hair is on fire, guaranteed. Before our last question, um, I have an ask for the audience. If you're enjoying this, my ask is um, to support us on Instagram. It's H-Y-G, this is our tag. And if you're enjoying it, tag the Instagram handle so that we can grow. Also, tag Patrick's company, Realty Executive. Yeah. I'm sure they would really Realty appreciate Executive that. National, absolutely. So again, H-Y-G, this, and share on the stories. And now to the last question, who would like to ask? All right, yeah. right in front of um, you. I think this is actually a typical question that you've probably been asked a lot, and I think I've gotten the same answer to this question every time I ask it. That's no pressure, I'm still asking anyway. Um, so if you had to go back in time, right, you seem like you're very successful, you've been through a lot, you've seen a lot, you've done a lot. If you had to go back in time and change anything that you've done to impact how you are now and how your company is now. Would you do it? And if you would, what would it be? So for those that didn't hear it, the question is if I could go back in time, what would I change? If there's anything I want to change, I think right. is the question. Right. So the answer is uh, I wouldn't change anything. Let me start off with. I know that's not the typical answer, um, but I wouldn't change anything. Um, here, here's the thing. And by the way, there's a whole bunch of things I wish hadn't happened. And there's a whole bunch of things I wish I wouldn't have done different. But the truth of the matter is with the sum of the parts. So, so, so the analogy I give is um, 
if John had a, had an airplane had a uh, had a uh, uh, sorry had an airline company, and he's and he's had it for 20 years, never had an accident, never been late, never had an issue. I'd I'd hate to fly his and be and find out that 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 one time because it statistically says it's going to happen. I'd hate to jump on that airline. So for me, there's a a book that I'm never going to write called Skin Knees, and I think there's a whole reason why you've got you've got scars, you've got pains. And as much as you could take some of those back because you blew out this or you got hurt here, some of those parts, right? And those some of the parts aren't just from a physical body standpoint, from a mental standpoint. So, yeah, as much as it would pain me, again, I, I, if I had to go back and I knew the pain was involved in it, I probably wouldn't be as gung-ho. But truth of the matter, if I could go back in time, and I'm glad I couldn't go back in time, I wouldn't change that. I wouldn't. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, the one thing, one thing, sorry. Yeah, go for it. I would have picked a blonde earlier, by the way. That's the only thing. <laughs> Before uh, we wrap this uh, completely, and this is on to eight for those who want to stick around, is anybody working on something that they want us to share to everyone here? So I always like to give people a chance to plug in what they do because if you don't share what you're doing, how else are people going to help? So I, one person, uh, just raise your hand, and I'm going to give you the mic for 60 seconds, and then you can share what you're working on or something that you need help with. Anybody? No one wants to share, I'll share, but I'd rather not. So All right, raise your, raise your, anybody want to raise their hand? This is a big opportunity. OK. Um, are you raising your hand? Yeah. All right, you can come on for 60 seconds. I only need 20. All right, awesome. go for it. Oh, there. Ready? Yeah, go back there. Thank you, folks. Um, I'm a business lawyer, which sounds like a contradiction. You guys ask any of these experienced business people what they think of lawyers. Once I'm out of earshot, you'll find out. But we, we start businesses. We help you structure them. We can buy them, sell them. And if something goes wrong, we sue them. So uh, as always, I hope to work with you in one of those categories and maybe not the others. Joe, a round of applause for Joe for coming here. Well, by the way, we do love, I love attorneys because I can tell you I've got an entire in-house legal team. And so one thing I've learned early on is um, you want to make, you want to be friends with attorneys. I will tell you that uh, some of the best attorneys in town I never used, but they were on my payroll because I didn't, I conflicted them out. I conflicted out the best of the best in the market strategically, so I'm a big fan of attorneys. Quick story about Joe. I actually met him at SIP uh, probably in May, right? You didn't know who I was, and you were just hanging out around, and you just came, and it's really cool to see that you're here now as like an attendee, and I just want to shout that out because I think it's awesome for you to come up on stage and sharing you know, what you're working on. So kudos to you. And then Patrick, um, this is awesome. I, you know, I'm really grateful that you took time to do this with us. Something that I learned and something our Sapphire team will, you know, appreciate is through you. You know, I learned. You were talking about performance reviews, how you're not part of there, but you're there as a, a coach, a career coach. Yeah. And I've been kind of just figuring out, like, you know, as our team scales, where where am I in the bigger picture? Because now, you know, I'm grateful that we got amazing people to do everything. And I kind of got a little lost. Yeah. But because of what you said, I think, like, you know, my role now is to be, like, a career coach to Leo or Eric in the back, Shakti, or, uh, you know, my team here. So I, I'm thankful for that advice. Yeah. And two, thank you to everybody for coming out on this Monday night. Um, I know there's plenty of things that you all can do. So, yeah, yeah, go for it. Um, you might want to stand up. It's a... No, maybe I'll sit here. <laughs> yeah. um, let me just say that one thing that I can say, looking over here, the Leah, no pain, no gain. I think you've heard that like a hundred thousand times as a football player. And um, you know, I'm an Ohio State Buckeyes. That's a whole other story. But, but, um, but I think the other thing that gets lost is having somebody with the credibility that Patrick has to be able to position you. When you're ready to make the next step, 
having someone who's there for you, who's been through all the wars, and can put you when he thinks you're you're ready to take that next step, he does that. And being a part of YPO as you are, it's invaluable. And his ability to just be able to put you in a place when he thinks you're ready to take that next step, it's unbelievable. I mean, we just made the Inc. 5000, we're on the Inc. 5000, um, the one of the fastest growing That's awesome. companies yes. in America. And we're the 225th fastest growing healthcare company in the country. And this is something I started out in my car. And so if we can go from where we were to where we are in our, now, you're always on a journey. And to have someone with the caliber of Patrick Van der Bosch, I cannot tell you how important and what meaning it has for me. And the other thing I will leave you with is purposeful engagement and have a mutuality of the relationship with the person that you're in. So it's not always about the technology part of it, it's building the right relationships with the right people. And Patrick does that in spades. So that's where I am. Thank you, John. But Thank you, John, for your time. By the way, John will tell you the number one thing that he'll tell you, he said, first of all, kind things. This company's grown 300%, by the way, since, not because of me, but because I helped him focus on the right things. He had all the answers, by the way, but like a lot of us, we end up doing so many things that we delude ourselves in the things that really move the needle. But the one thing he's, he will tell you without a doubt is that I genuinely care about him. And early about Gen Z, those are the things that companies miss, is genuine care. Anyone on my team will tell you I genuinely care about them. Doesn't mean that we always agree. That doesn't mean, no different than our daughter, if there's something, if there's something not fun to talk about, it's gonna have, Denise will tell you, I'm the disciplinarian in our family, but I don't, I don't, the worst discipline is for me to sit, for our daughter, back she's younger, sit down and have a conversation with her. But for John, the number one thing is that he had someone who truly cared about him and cared about his business. Oh, that was a powerful testimonial. Well, the other thing I will say too is finding someone who puts your self-interest in front of theirs. And it's hard to find that. That's serve, that, by the way, you talked about servant, that's servant leadership. That's what servant leadership looks like. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, no, it's, how long have you been mentoring him for? Almost two, two and a half years. Two and a half years. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, the relationship that we have is, I mean, I can bounce off stuff. I mean, we go back and forth with things all the time. And, you know, our mindsets are always in tune. And, you know, what, how to grow the business. And he knows I do the business and research and I do all that stuff. So it's not hard for me just to have a, a mutual conversation with him. Yeah. Yeah. And earlier you said how how old were you how old were you earlier? <laughs> I was saying you were telling me you know. No. So if if you guys like you know in Phoenix business to have twenty under twenty thirty under thirty in this business people. So in November I'll be seventy. 70 years old. Yeah. Yeah. 70. That's. You know, it doesn't matter what age you are, you got to have the energy to be able to keep going. I have a lot of my friends who are the entire purposeful engagement, so keep that age up. Yeah. So it's Yeah. I think that. Yeah. That. You're still, you're inspiring. It, it, you're, you're inspiring, and what you're doing is amazing. And when you told me you're almost 70, I, I you, you look like you're 50. That's, that's what that my initial that thought is. So I, whatever you're doing. But I love what I do. Yeah. So, yeah. And that's the other thing about work is having that passion for something. You can't substitute that. Things. Yeah. So passion is the key to staying youthful. I think so. Yeah. That's part of it, and eating. Yeah. 
and sleep in. Okay. The, That's the, the last person I want to shout is Josh here. He's recording our podcast, which will be awesome. So shout out to Josh. And uh, I'm out of words, Patrick. You can close this uh, conversation. Well, first of all, I, I'm, I am grateful because you guys all chose to be here. You, you sacrificed your time to be here. I'm very grateful for that. I hope to whatever extent that I've inspired you, motivated you, validated you, um, it, it was absolutely my pleasure to do that. But also know from, for, for me and, and Denise and for John for this case, um, I always enjoy doing this because, trust me, I, 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 I met Laura, I, I, learned, I meet people. For me, it's a lifelong, I'm a lifelong student and don't ever stop being a student, <laughs> trust me. Um, there's an Eastern saying that a great teacher doesn't create students, a great teacher creates other great teachers. And so continue on that journey. I wish all of you well. Um, the fact that you're here means I'm pretty sure you're in the at least 10%, if not the 5%, because other people are choosing to do something different. So I, I applaud you for that. But thank you so much. Thank you. That's it. Yep. And I'll turn the music back on. <laughs> So you guys can oh, and, and the dance floor is open. <laughs> <laughs> I'll start DJing. <laughs>